Now I'm going to give everybody watching this video a little bit of a break because what I'm not going to do, much to everybody's relief, is I am not going to recite the specs and the dimensions and the number of watts of power handling of every single speaker we make in order. You want to know what the specs are, you want to know what the power handling is, you want to know what the efficiency is, do me a favor, go to the product page and read the spec sheet. I wrote all the spec sheets so they're really good and it would make me feel terrific if you actually read them. However, what I am going to do for you now, instead of reciting in some monotonous tone, this has got 12 watts and this has got 14 watts of power handling and this is a one inch tweeter, instead of doing that, what I am going to do is I'm going to answer some more commonly asked questions about speaker placement and the way different surround speakers operate some of the things that people actually think about and information they can use when looking to put in a home theater system in their home that will make things go more smoothly and a little more comfortably and a little more confidence inspiring in terms of putting good equipment in your home and getting it to sound right. So, let's start off with placement. People always say, where do I put this stuff? It's like, you know, I've got all this nice equipment now and I went out and I purchased all this really good gear and I've got this nice designer working with my professional installer and where do I put the stuff? How do I integrate it into my living space? Because unless you've built a dedicated room, which you may have and more power to you, it's wonderful if you've built a dedicated room. But if you haven't, you've got to kind of figure out where to put it and where it's going to sound good and look good. So let's have a look at that. Start with the front channels of the, of the home theater system. You've got three speakers. You've got a left and a center and a right. And where do you put them? Okay, to start off with, get the front speakers so that they're approximately six to eight feet apart. Maybe just a hair more separation than they would be in an old two-channel stereo music system, as if anybody has two-channel music systems anymore. But if you did, have these just a tick wider, just a tick farther apart than you would for a two-channel music system. About one and a half to two feet on either side of the screen. So if you've got a five-foot screen and you're two feet on either side, then maybe about eight or nine feet between the front speakers. What you might want to do, and you'll experiment th with this to find out whether or not it sounds better in your particular room or not, you might want to do what we call towing the speaker in. Now, when a speaker is straight out, Firing straight out, that's not towed in. If this was the right speaker of the theater system, you might want to tow it in just a little bit so it aims more or less at the prime listening area. That's for you to decide. So about eight or nine feet apart, a couple feet on either side of the television set. Now with respect to the center channel speaker, this is pretty important. What you want to do is see if you can get the tweeters of the center channel speaker and the left-right speaker within about 18 inches of vertical height to one another. If you can do that, then as sounds go across the front stage of the theater system, it'll sound like one nice continuous sound. It won't sound like three distinct sound sources. If they're matched in vertical height within about 18 inches, it'll sound, your ears will make it sound to your brain like it's one continuous sound going across the front. So if it's an airplane or a train whooshing back and forth, it'll sound nice and continuous. That's one thing you should do. As far as your surrounds are concerned, what you want to do with surrounds is mount them to the sides of the listening area and above ear level. And I'll go into more detail on the kind of surrounds there are in a second. If eventually you may go to a 7.1 system instead of a 5.1 system, leave the rear walls blank. By far, most of the surround information comes from side-mounted surrounds. If you want to go to that 7.1 system, leave the rear walls blank, and you can always add the two rear wall surrounds to go from 5.1 to 7.1 at some later date. But if you add your first pair of surrounds, on the rear wall, then it gets a little dicier as to how you're going to match the sound and get a nice smooth fill when the side walls are, are left blank to begin with. So go fronts, 
subwoofer side surrounds. Leave the rear walls blank. You can always fill those in afterwards. Most of the time you're not going to need a 7-1 system unless you're in a really big room. But if you are, leave the back walls blank, add your surrounds there. Okay, as a matter of fact, as long as we're talking about surrounds, let's, let's talk about surrounds. When you go to a commercial movie theater, you know, before the lights go down, you look around the movie theater, and what do you see? You see a lot of loudspeakers. You know, there's probably 10 speakers on each side wall and another eight across the back, maybe more in a bigger theater. Well, you know, it's a lot of surround speakers. You know, it's 18, 24, who knows? It's a lot of surround speakers. And those surround speakers have a very important job because what those surround speakers do is they convey the three-dimensionality of the sound effects in a movie. If you're watching some undersea submarine thriller and you hear the sonar pangs and the rumbling of the engine inside the hull of the submarine, that echo sound is being provided by the surround sound speakers. And the important thing to remember about surround sound speakers is you can't point to them and say, aha, there's the surround sound. That's what we call a non-localizable sound. In other words, your ear can't localize or pinpoint by direction exactly where the sound is coming from. And that's very important because the rustling of leaves in a forest or the hustle and bustle of a city street in New York City or you know, the, the wind whipping through the desert, those are not sounds in life that you localize on. You don't go, aha, there's the desert when you're sitting in your living room and there's thunder outside, you just hear thunder all around you. You don't go, aha, there's the thunder, it's coming right from there. It's three-dimensional, it is non-directional, it is non-localizable. So that's what surround speakers do in a commercial movie theater. They convey non-localizable, non-directional, ambient sound. Great, fine, terrific. You probably never noticed the speakers in a commercial movie theater and you probably never will again. But <laughs> When you go to add a pair of surround speakers or two into a home theater, all of a sudden it becomes apparent that you're only being allowed by the owner of the house or the installer or the designer or the budget or all of the above, you're only allowed to add one, maybe, maybe two pairs of surround speakers. So the job is, as a speaker manufacturer, how do we get one pair of surround speakers to sound in your living room the way 24 surround speakers sounds in a commercial movie theater. Well, the way you do that is by using what we call a non-localizable speaker. This is our model 2200 SR, but it's very similar in design to the 4200 or the 6200 or the 8200. I happen to be using a 2200 because it's a little lighter and smaller and I can actually hold it without getting tired. But what you see is two banks of drivers. And this would be mounted on the wall, like this. And one bank fires towards the front of the room, the other bank fires towards the rear of the room. And this edge comes right out at the side of the listeners. Now this is what's known as a bipole design loudspeaker, in which the two sides of drivers are out of phase with each other, which is kind of a fancy way of saying that one bank moves in when the other bank is moving out and it creates a, a null or quiet field right alongside the front of the speaker. So when the speaker is mounted alongside you, you don't hear it directly because the plus and the minus sound waves are canceling out. So you don't hear it, which is great. Because what that allows the sound to do, it allows the sound to get away from the speaker without betraying its location without being localizable. Sound gets out away from the speaker. It reflects off the ceilings, off the floor, off the front wall, off the back wall. And it comes at your ears from multiple locations, all at slightly different times. And so it fools your ear. Your ear says, ah, this is great. You know, there's, there's 24 pairs of surround speakers in my living room, just like there are in a commercial movie theater. But there isn't, there's only one pair but it's a diffuse field bipole design. And the sound is coming out your ear from several directions 
at slightly different times because each path length is a little bit different, takes a little bit longer or shorter for the sound to reach your ears. And that's how a single pair of surround speakers does a great convincing job of fooling your ears into thinking that there are many surround speakers in your living room and that gives you a very convincing and realistic three-dimensional surround field. So that's what you do with surrounds. To the sides of the listening area, bipoles are best. Let me draw that for you. Bear with my limited artistic abilities here as I do try to draw this for you. But we mentioned that surround speakers will sound the best if they're right alongside the listening area. So there are your bipole speakers right alongside the listening area. Mount them high. Mount them above ear level when seated. If it's an eight foot ceiling, mount them about two feet down from the ceiling. So they're about six feet off the floor. That works out really well because seated ear height is about three and a half or four feet. Now there are other kind of surround speakers. There's what's called bipole speakers where there are two banks of drivers but they're in phase instead of out of phase. Those are a little more localizable. So you have to mount them either a little higher or perhaps a little farther behind or slightly more in front of the listening area so it's a little tougher to grab onto their location by ear. They work nicely. Um, you can use regular old front firing speakers which are sometimes called direct radiators and the trick with the direct radiator and the mistake that most people make is they angle them down. Oh, well there's a speaker, I should angle it down so that the tweeters and woofer are pointing directly at the listening area, which is exactly the wrong thing to do. As we've demonstrated, what you want to do with a surround speaker is get it so that its sound is not localizable, so you cannot tell where it's coming from, so that the sound instead reflects all around the listening room. So if you're going to use conventional forward-facing speakers, which are known as direct radiators, direct radiators as surround speakers, mount them in such a way that they point away from the main listening area, either straight out above the heads or even angled slightly back so they reflect off the side walls and back walls before reflecting back in to the listening area. That's a good thing to do with surround speakers. So there's a general discussion of how to mount surrounds, where to mount them, the difference between bipoles, dipoles, and direct radiators. That's surround speakers. Let me cut.